Hi everyone, welcome back to PCA's Garage. Welcome to Tech Tactics Live number seven. We're here in Maryland. If this is the first time you've joined us, uh, this is a, a version of us to be able to bring you some technical information uh, since we can't really go to events. Uh, the the pre-roll film that you saw was driving and, and, and you know some of us are able to do that, but we can't gather or haven't been able to gather to really do tech sessions. So this is what we've came up with. We're in Columbia, Maryland at PCA National Headquarters. And although we are open in terms of um, being able to have people in our facility here, uh, we still have to do practice social distancing and such. And so really it's just me in the garage and we have a couple of people in the other side of the building um, controlling all of the IT. So we are limited in views and such. So. Uh, please forgive us for not having a great diversity of different shots, but hopefully you'll have fun with us nonetheless. Um, today we're talking about how to take better pictures of your Porsche. So many times when you go to events, you see everybody grabbing their so cell phones and, and, and such and, and taking shots of their car. And I've seen varying qualities of shots, some that are Instagram worthy and some that you really shouldn't share. Um, I take a lot of photos with my phone, with my camera gear and such. And the one person that I often look towards for advice is one of our dear friends who contributes uh, um, tremendously uh, to Porsche Panorama, our, our magazine, uh, contributes to events, contributes to a lot of images that we use for uh, advertising and uh, promoting PCA from San Rafael, California. Allow me to welcome Michael Allen Ross. Michael, how are you, my friend? Great. Thank it, you so much for having me. It's good, good to see you. Good to see your face. I wish we were in person, but this is the next best thing. Um, yeah. Now, Tech Tactics, I don't know, uh, Michael, if, you, if you've seen Tech Tactics before, but normally we're doing things with wrenches and we're working on cars. I don't know if you can see the beautiful car that we have here. It's a, a 2021 Aventurine green over truffle brown interior. We're not going to be working on this car today. We are just going to admire it from afar, um, but we're going to talk about how to take stunning photos um, of vehicles such as this. But before we get into that, let me remind everyone, if this is your first time, be sure to put your name and where you're from in the live chat area and do so before 8.30 uh, because we have two great prizes and I want to share it to you. It's worth opening it up. Normally, I don't open up the prizes, but this is just so beautiful. It's from Kef. It's a Muo Bluetooth speaker, and I just want you to see the color of this. It goes together really well with this Aventurine Green, and uh, someone that's watching tonight, this will be shipped right to your house. And um, to add to that, we have another prize that uh, Michael Allen Ross is going to autograph a photo that he took. I believe it's a panorama photo and uh, we'll ship that directly to you and you can put it up uh, in your favorite car area. So again, there it is. Awesome shot. All right, so let's just jump right into it. Um, on my table here, I don't know if you can see, but I brought some of the gear that I normally use to take photos. Obviously, the cell phone a lot of times. When I'm walking around and I want something light, I carry something like this. And if I'm really looking to be creative and trying to get that shot, I might carry something like this, a DSLR. So my first question to Michael, um, smartphone versus DSLR, what do we need to know about it? Well, um, as we know, the smartphone keeps getting better and better, don't we? Uh, there's an old phrase that says, you know, the the best camera to have is the one you have in your hand at the moment because there's nothing like grabbing for a phone or grabbing for your camera or grabbing for the camera in your phone and it's not there. So um, the best one to have is what you have with you. But there are definite advantages to some one over the other and um, we're going to take you through that a little bit and, uh, and show you the difference a little bit later on. Sometimes I find myself, if I haven't used my non-phone gear, like I tend to think that, oh, maybe I don't need that stuff anymore. Because as you said, the camera phones these days 
are amazing. Just five years difference in terms of quality and, and speed and memory and all that kind of stuff. But having said that, when I do take the time to grab one of these or the, the SLR, I, I come back to my computer and I look at the files and it just justifies why I keep this, these around. So, well, one of the reasons, go ahead. One of the great differences there, um, you'll find if, if you grab your, your smartphone and take a photograph, um, you're taking a picture a lot of times. Um, and the other tools offer you the opportunity to create an image. You have so many things in there that you can go in and get very detailed before you open the shutter. And that's what I think is the big difference here between taking a picture and creating an image. That's so true. And the, we're showing a video right now for the audience to see. Um, the pictures that you take takes a lot of work. I think you talk about your images being 90% logistics and 10% actually shooting the shot. Oh, definitely. And I'm looking at you. You, yeah. <laughs> this one was actually. It looked like a dry day, but I've seen you on a muddy day down in in the dirt, in the in the gravel, and just you know, and, and also doing this at like five in the morning or five thirty in the morning to get the 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 perfect light, the golden hour, either in the morning or in the evening. You work hard for these images. Yeah, what you can't see is it, it's a winter day there. I've got a. I've got a, a down vest underneath that jacket, and it's pretty cold. Um, you have to deal with the elements. Um, everything is logistics for me. You know, it's about getting the vehicle into the right place at the right time um, and, and orchestrating everything. 10% um, of what I do is actually shooting, I think. Everything else is, is arranging everything, getting everybody together and, um, and making, it, making it happen. That's, that's the real work behind what I do. All right, so let's, let's get started with tips for folks to take better photos. Um, there's probably m hundreds of tips or more, uh, but Michael and I kind of talked about 10 tips that we can share with you that's fairly easy to implement and get you taking better pictures. So let's start with number one. Let's start with reflection. Hopefully we'll get a picture up here and talk about reflections. All right. While we're working on let's talk about it while they're trying to pull up the image. So reflections. Well, um, well, one of the things that people have to realize is that an automobile is a large reflective object. You have to look at everything in the car. Um, I use a polarizer on a regular basis, but if you're if you're taking a photograph of an automobile, look at everything that's reflecting in the automobile. Yeah. We get very distracted with, with um, various things, and we miss a lot if we're not paying attention to those little things that are being reflected. It could be a garbage can in the corner. It could be somebody's white sneaker. Um, it could be... It You'll could be never anything. wear white but sneakers it, again to a Concorde because they're going to end up in photos. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's, here's an example here. Um, this is uh, this was sent in to us. This is a you see a, a, a few things. Great shot, right? The, the uh, uh, perspective is wonderful. You've got the Porsche crest straight up and down. You've taken the time to, to make sure that it's straight up and down rather than lying on its side or upside down. Um, but you've neglected to see a couple of things. If you zoom in closely on that, you'd see that there's a tree reflecting in all the area around the Porsche crest. Yep. And if you look a little closer, you'd see your own elbow and your body reflecting in the brake right, right there. Um, so even though this, this is a, a, a great effort, um, we just kind of missed it right there, right? There's, those two little things will really make a difference. And this is about learning to see. You really learn to look for those things before you uh, put your finger down and open that shutter. Look at everything in the frame. The toughest thing is to learn that aspect of it, looking at everything before you create the image. And, and what you've taught me is, you know, th that same picture of the wheel. Like your your original intent is to take a cool shot of that wheel, but.
but when you actually go to photograph that wheel, you've taught me to look deeper into the picture to catch all of the possible negative things. I remember back, like I think it was like in the 80s, where they had those like pictures where you had to stare for a while, and then after a while you could see like the image of a, I don't know, a, a, an aquarium or something like that, right? So, right. so, it, so in that yeah. picture of the wheel, the obvious thing is perfectly fine, but where it makes a difference is when you're looking at the wheel and you see the elbow, you see somebody laying on their side trying to get that great perspective, but you know, you see the, their elbow and arm and that's a distraction to the photo. So um, right. yeah, all that effort was kind of wasted because it's, it would, I guess you could do that, you could do that later in post um, editing, but you want to try to, sure. I assume you want to try to take that picture the best you can at first click. Yeah, that's that's my objective every time. Yep. <laughs> I, I I like to say I'm a lazy guy, but all I'm really doing is trying to eliminate a lot of that extra work just by addressing it right up front. Exactly. Um, and if you dr address it right up front, you're ahead of the game already. Let's go to tip number two, intersections. And intersections specifically with the car. So hopefully we'll get so a picture So you have there. the body of the car and what you want to do is you want to be very, very careful what intersects the body. If I take a look at this image, you see several things at that roof line. The wall is cutting through the top. I'm, I'm going to go from... That the, looks, that looks like I'm the seeing. 2021 992 Turbo has a very large power antenna. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a couple of things. Um, right. Um, the, the light pole coming out of the vehicle. Notice how the mirror on the right side of the car blends in with the wall and intersects it. And then that wall cuts through the window and comes out the roof on the other side. It was, if you had just changed your perspective and your angle a little bit, you would have been able to eliminate that. This, on the, on the back end, if you're gonna go in and retouch this, this is a lot of work to take care of. Maybe a lot of work for somebody, and maybe very easy for someone else. Yeah. But in my perspective, I think it's something that I would have addressed ahead of time, and it probably wouldn't have taken that taken that shot. I would have I would have changed my body angle, or or adjusted the car. I always say it's easier to move me than it does to move a five thousand or three thousand pound vehicle. Um, cars don't take direction very well, but I can move pretty quickly. Yeah, and speaking of which, that's that's our third tip for tonight is to move your body, move around, don't move the car. And when you move around, you change the, 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 the point of view of the car and you can avoid you know, light poles, you can avoid trees, you can avoid reflections. Moving around is very important. Yeah. What's right. good about this is the dish of the wheel, you notice the dish of the wheel was turned towards the camera. Yeah. That's one thing you always wanna make sure that dish is reflecting towards the camera rather than uh, you don't want to see tread on that front. Oh, that's Personally, good... I like to have the wheels totally straight. Yeah. Um, it's very, um, um, uh, very linear that way if the wheel is straight rather than pitched. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to pitch it, make sure the dish of the wheel is towards the camera lens. Oh, that's a good point. So the next one, let's talk about composition. So we have a photo for that. All right, Safari 911. Okay. This is um, <laughs> this is called a lack of composition. As far, <laughs> uh, um, I guess you know I don't want to be too critical, but hey, great, fabulous car, famous car, everybody loves this car, but there was there's so many things that are taking away from the element of the vehicle right now. The the people in the background, the tree that's coming out of the roof of the vehicle. That's one of my little sticklers of several people. I'm famous for telling people that their their car is not a planter. Yeah. Um, there shouldn't be a tree, a, a tree coming out of the hood or anywhere in the car. Um, the sign that's on the left of the car, the other car that's coming off the, the front corner there. There are so many things that are taking away from the vehicle right now that I because of the fact that I look for these things, I can't even look at the car. I'm looking at everything that's going on around it. And at the same time, what you've done is you've really filled up the frame and there's nothing really else, nothing else going on in there. 
Yeah, and let, let me say, whoever took this photo, I don't know who took the photo, we're not, looking, we're not uh, making fun of you, but we're using you as an example, or your photo as an example of how to take better photos. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the sign that's kind of cut off, the, the parking stripes on the side that has, uh, I think, another sign that's standing there, the three people that are walking across the back, the light poles that are coming out of the fender, the little red, looks like a Miata or something, um, yeah, and the tree that's growing out the side of it. It's almost looking like your hair is standing up from bedhead or something. Uh, but it's a beautiful car, but because there's so many of these other distractions, I mean, you could, worse comes to worse, if you just cropped in and just showed the beautiful headlights or the, the, the rally lights and just forget about all the other stuff, like that would be, to me, a more impactful picture. All right, so the next one, let's talk about engaging the viewer. All right, so this picture here, um, maybe the person was excited that someone did a donut in the circle, I'm not sure, or maybe they were <laughs> excited that they were at this event, they were excited of the little Japanese truck there, I'm not exactly sure, and I think what we're saying with this picture is trying to engage a viewer, trying to tell them with your photo what to look at. Like if, if, your, if your thought was, look at the donuts uh, marks there, then okay, you probably got me. But if you're really excited about that 993 turbo or the little Japanese truck or something, then you really need to kind of come closer to it or, 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 or do something to bring the person's eye to focus on that. Am I right? Yeah, in many ways. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to that later on when we engage the viewer in a proper way. Um, yeah. We'll give you an example of that later. Uh, there's ways to do it and ways not to do it. All right. So we are down to, let's see, that was our fifth, right? So we had reflections intersections, move your body, composition, engage the viewer. Before we move on, what I would like to do is introduce a game. It's called Smartphone or DSLR. And we're going to bring up a picture, and I don't know what's what, and we're going to try to guess as the audience, was this photo taken with a smartphone or was it taken with a DSLR? So let's see our first picture. Ooh. So, huh, hmm, so the lighting, to get lighting like this with a DSLR would be really, really challenging because you have the brights of the headlight and you have the, the ground and you have this, the sunset in the back. For some reason, Smartphones, to me, do a great job of this. Now, unless you spent a lot of time editing this picture, Michael, I'm gonna say this was taken with a smartphone. So am I, uh, so oh. if this is a game, am I supposed to tell you what's right or wait till the end? Uh, you, uh, so go back, go back to that picture, guys. So I, yes, please tell us, what, what, what did you use to take this photo? That was done with a smartphone. Yes. So was everything I saying the reason why or, or how I could tell? Was that right? Well, uh, yeah, it, it did a really good job, um, really balancing things really quickly. Um, if you see the, the final image, it'll be a, a lot different. Um, uh, there's a lot that goes into capturing that with a, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. Um, you're always fighting two things. You're always fighting light versus stability. Um, when it comes to those uh, bigger tools. But, but a smartphone can go in there and grab it right away. And um, in this case, there's a little flare that's coming from the uh, um, headlamp, which usually comes from something that we forget to do. We keep putting our phone in our back pocket, and we forget to wipe that little lens clean. Yeah. Uh, and you get schmutz on there and that sort of thing. So you get this little... So sometimes you'll get a streak, or you'll go, oh, that's really cool. Well, it's, it's a giveaway sometimes that it's a, that it's a, uh, it's a smartphone because just because there's dirt on the lens. Yeah, but <laughs> it's a to do that. A lot a, of people forget the. It's a gorgeous photo. It's a gorgeous photo. 
All right, let's do one more. Okay, so ni beautiful 918 spider looking at the reflections. Does any you guys want to guess on the live chat if that is SLR or smartphone? Mm. The details are really good. But I don't know that, I don't know, would you have had, like this almost seems like it was taken off the cuff. Like it wasn't like a staged shot. So if it's not a staged shot, I'm still going to guess, and everything is in focus. There's no, there's no depth of field that, say, an SLR you could introduce to make it look a little bit more artistic. So again, I'm going to guess this one is a smartphone picture. And you win. Yes. It is a smartphone. It, because what I use now, years ago, I used to use the Polaroid. But now what I use is I use a smartphone instead to line up my shot, put things together, and then come back in and really create the image. Um, in that shot, the final image was completely different. But that's where I use it as a, uh, um, as a Polaroid instead these days. Very cool. All right, well, so hopefully everyone's enjoying the game of smartphone or DSLR, but let's get back to our tips. Um, and, and actually, before we get to the tips, we, this is a technical show, right? So let's talk photography. Um, oh, actually, before we get into that, we had a question. How do you avoid the reflections if you cannot move somewhere else? From Walter Fassberg. Well, one of the tricks they use is uh, something called a polarizer. It goes on your lens. If you have, if you've ever had uh, or purchased polarized sunglasses, it's the same thing. You're taking that lens and putting it on the front of your lens, and that is going to eliminate these these reflections um, from the sun and all that, all those other things. But sometimes, if I mean, if if you can't move your body and there's something reflecting in the car, take the time to move the thing that's reflecting in it. I mean. Sometimes it's the simplest thing that's, you know, somebody left their camera bag there and you didn't take the time to go move the camera bag, um, th that sort of thing. So you have a couple of ways to do it. Either move your body, move the item itself, use a polarizer, which will help with various reflections with the sun and that sort of thing. Um, but it, it's first about seeing the actual reflection and then finding a way to deal with it. One of, one of my pet peeves is, is if I'm uh, attending a car show or a concour and granted you need to collect trash but for some reason the trash cans that they buy are these like white bright white cardboard boxes that they leave all over the field and when you take pictures you have these white splotches reflecting off of cars and that's that would certainly be the case if I saw that I would walk over and move that white box so good tip that's it all right garbage cans and, and, and outhouses <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move a porta pot. <laughs> All right. So what I was about to get into was I want to make sure that this is technical since it is Tech Tactics Live. So let's introduce a couple of technical terms with regards to photography. So let's talk about what a lot of people have heard, maybe even talk about, but don't truly understand, and that is rule of thirds. And there, there we, we have an image. I have, this is not a hashtag, well it is a hashtag, but we're referring to this hashtag as rule of thirds. So you want to explain to folks um, the importance of rule of thirds? Certainly. Well, this is, going to, this is going to give us a call back to what we talked about in engaging the viewer. Your eye wants to start somewhere, I mean a successful image, you know, and this has, whether it's an image, a, a painting, a, a piece of architecture, sculpture, your eye wants to start somewhere. And then you want to allow the viewer to have enough negative space to go on a journey. They want to, initially you go right to the boat, right? And then your eye starts to go around in a clockwise rotation throughout this image and comes back to the boat. That's natural. And it allows the, um, the viewer to go in there and start to tell their own story. Oh, where is this? What time of day is it? Why, why are those other boats there? Why is this boat on a trailer and those boats aren't? Um, you know, there's all these little things. Whose footsteps are those? Um, 
boy, the clouds are fabulous, you know. But if you, if you fill the whole frame with just the boat, you wouldn't see all those other things, and you wouldn't be able to engage the viewer. So by allowing negative space in the image, by shifting it over to the left, or if you had the, the boat in the, towards the upper right, it gives it a great, um, great um, advantage in terms of uh, getting the viewer to stop a few moments. I mean, in today's day and age, we're constantly flipping and you know swiping images. If you can get people to take a few more moments and actually digest and come into your image, then you've won. You've done the right thing. You've given them the opportunity to enjoy that image and to reflect a little bit and tell their own story. That's creating an image. Absolutely, and that, that photo with the boat, um, as we were playing around and just zooming on the boat, you lose so much of that story, so much of the detail, so much beauty of that image if you were just simply to take, you know, straight center of the boat. You'd miss, miss out on so much. So um, with rule of thirds, you know, creating, creating that um, pathway for people to enjoy the, 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 the view that you have, um, it, it's a very useful tool. And you see how you just, like that, you just lose so much um, when, you, when you bring it in. You, you pull it out and you have some of that negative space you were talking about. Um, it's just so, so much more of a dramatic photo. So let's talk about one more um, technical term, and that is depth of field. So depth of field is a very powerful tool. It allows you to choose what you want the viewer to concentrate on. You've combined two things in this image, and this is the uh, rule of thirds. The image is not centered. It's off to the upper right-hand corner there where your focal point is. And by choosing a, a shallow depth of field, everything else in the background goes out of focus. And that brings all the attention to exactly what you want them to look at. Now, the rule of thumb is the higher the number on your depth of field, the more is in focus. The, sh the lower the number, the shallower the depth of field. So if, you have, if you're at 1.2, you know, um, you're at, or let's say you're at 2.8, um, it's going to be shallow. 1.2 is going to be shallow, up to 5.6. And then, you know, so anything up in there, and then it starts to get we start to get into F8, F11, F16, F22. When you want the entire field in, in, uh, in focus, you want the higher number. If you just want that blade of grass in front of you, you want the lower number. So a good rule to go by is do you want the entire forest, do you want the trees, or are you focusing on the bark? If you think of it that way, um, that's a very simple explanation of depth of field. And I think uh, I love playing with depth of field, um, but I will also say until recently where phones, you know, they had sort of a artificial way of creating depth of field. But if you were to create depth of field with an SLR, um, to be able to it was actually kind of costly because, you know, most cameras are F, like an F, F3 is the, like the lowest or 3.5 is like the lowest. Uh, and in order to, to get a lens that could go down to 2.8 or 1.2, you know, that glass or that lens was quite expensive. But if you're really into photography and you like the, dra you know, the drama that you can introduce into your photo, um, you know, investing in something like that, uh, you know, a, a, a lens that can go down to 2.8 or 1.2, 1.4 or something like that, uh, your, your, your pictures or your photos, just they're just at a different level. All right, so we've talked about uh, depth of field. We've talked about rule of thirds. Again, hopefully you can see this and not always putting everything in the center. N leave some negative space. That's, that, that in itself is probably going to you know, make your photos um, even better. All right, so let's go to the number six tip that we have for you, and that is to get low. Get low, get low, get low. Do we have an image for that? And we saw some of this with your video, 
We saw some of this with the photo um, with the rim. Okay, that's really low. <laughs> That's how I usually end up. But you'll see in this photograph, you'll notice um, that my tripod, I haven't reversed. The camera's on the ground. Yeah. So, um, uh, I have it, re the shaft is reversed, locked down, and um, it just gives me a totally different perspective uh, when I'm shooting down there. Um, yeah, that was a very long day. That's how I usually end up at the end of the day. <laughs> so, so, so when you're... not a lot left of me. So when you're down low like that, again, it just makes the photo so much more dramatic. Um, or in this case, you're going high. Tell, right. tell me about that Changing photo. Your pers well, this is, you know, I wanted to get uh, the vehicles and I wanted to see enough of the background. And I wanted to um, change, by changing my perspective, I had a whole different view. If I just stood there and took the photograph, I mean, anybody could do that. But it's wonderful to add a little bit different perspective. Sometimes I'm jumping in the back of a pickup truck or climbing on the top of something, and sometimes I'm laying on the ground. But by changing your perspective, it gives that image a little bit of a different advantage. You know, I, I keep thinking that uh, I wish I was six foot six sometimes because those guys have completely different images than I do. You know, if I so I have to rely on the other tools to get me up in different places to give me those things. But at the same time, I can get to the ground a lot quicker too. So um, I'll take that one, you know? But yeah. by changing your perspective, it can really liven up the image and, and give you a different uh, view and uh, an idea. And for me, you know, I always try to strive for the perspective. You know, again, if you're, if you're at a car event and a car launch or whatever, there's probably 20 people around the car standing at eye level with the camera or even with their cell phone taking the same shots, right? So if I'm going right. to take a shot, I want to try to, as, as you did, get low, get high, go wide, or do something that is going to make my photo stand out from everyone else's. Yeah, a, sh a shoot with me is probably like a two and a half to four hour yoga class. <laughs> Um, by the time I'm done. That's good good for my health. what it comes down to. Yes, it, and I, I've is, seen how hard good. you work. I mean, it, it's li literally, it's, it's a physical, I should be drained at the end of a shoot, and if I'm not drained, then I didn't do it right. Um, and uh, that's, that's, I go into it, you know, just with an open mind, but at the time, my, my mind just keeps, I keep, keep trying to find different things, different ways of doing it. And um, it is exhausting, but it is. It's good for my health and uh, keeps me going, and um, it's, uh, it's exciting. You know, I love it. Very good. All right, I hear uh, someone scribbling over there. Does that mean we have, it's 8.33, so we should have our winners here that we'll announce shortly. Are there any questions? I think we're good. So let's go to the next tip and that has to do with lighting. Lighting, lighting, lighting. They're pulling. I'm not sure which kind of pull up. So lighting with these new uh, modern day smartphones, it's amazing how little lighting they need. In fact, um, I, I remember taking photos with my SLRs in say it's a, a banquet or something inside with you know mediocre light. Um, lighting can be a challenge, but uh, with these smartphones and with modern day different tools with flashes, you can uh, make up for it. So here's a picture talking about lighting, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is not a good example of lighting. Correct. <laughs> um, you want to have things balanced on the vehicle, you know, um, this is, uh, you have really harsh light coming on one side. Uh, the camera has basically, uh, was probably, you probably weren't metering. You metered off the front corner there, and the side of the car is blown out. Um, it's very um, important when it comes, comes down to logistics. You know, I go through a lot of things ahead of time when I'm doing a photograph of an automobile where I take, you know, if I'm flying into somewhere, let's say I go somewhere, we have certain locations, we'll go location scouting, and I go and stand in those spaces, and I literally say, the proper time to shoot this will be at 4.30, between 4.30 and 7, 
um, because the light's going to go over that hill at 515, um, and I know that the light will now be even on the car. Um, that's all about the logistics that I'm talking about, the things that go on before you create the image, um, rather than just taking a picture. You have to be able to really take control of the situation. And that's, you know, there's a big difference between, uh, you know, I was a musician for a long time. There's a big difference between the, the, the background singer and going up to the front. Um, and there's a, there's a big responsibility that changes when people say, hey, I want you to photograph this for me. And you, they've given you all this trust. Well, you need to come through with everything you've got and to make it work. Um, but with that comes a lot of different tools and a lot of planning and a lot of understanding and, um, and a lot of patience. Do we have a photo where you, there was lighting where you liked? Did you submit one of those? I'm sorry? Did you submit a photo where lighting looks good or a good example of using lighting properly? Yeah, I've, uh, I, there's a, I have a, they sh should have a ton of my images there with um, examples. All right, hopefully we can get one of those up. How are we get, doing over there, guys? There you go. Ooh, dramatic lighting. A little dramatic. Yeah. You know, and th this, this starts to come in with a lot of um, different things. You've got rule of thirds. You've got lighting going on here. You've got motion going on here. Um, here's an example here where you have um, the car is placed in a position. Here's another thing I want to point out, too. You know, I work with Richard Barron on these uh, pieces on a regular basis, and one thing that we're always looking at and I, when I'm taking a photograph and creating an image, I want to create something that's going to work for him when it comes to a layout. When I have placed the vehicle correctly, um, he has a place to put a gutter. He's got a place to split that image in half. If you don't have a place to, to um, let the gutter lay, there's no place you have no opportunity to get a double page spread out of something. So I try to keep those things in, in mind while I'm shooting. Um, here's another example of that. Could be just a motion shot. Um, this is a great fun shot. I think uh, um, you'll recognize the driver in there. We'll, we'll keep that a secret, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but you know, every one of these images has a real story behind it. And I think that's the, the thing that um, when you go back to your favorite images, you start to, um, Think about what it took to create that image and why is that uh, one of your favorite images. And there's a great deal of, it all has to do with the preparation and the people and, and the logistics of the image that make it a, uh, a successful image and an image that will last for years and one that you'll keep near and dear to your heart. There's always a story behind those really great images. This is a, this is a fun story with um, a gentleman in a car just had just come off of a, um, uh, the uh, Concord field the day before, and then we asked him to put it in the gravel and uh, got him up at the, the crack of dawn to do it. And the sky was, you know, uh, dramatic. And, um, of course, I'm laying on the ground again. There's a lot coming together here. But uh, it's about all those things behind the story that, uh, that you'll always remember. When, when I, I think I remember you coming back from that shoot and you were all muddy because you were laying in the... <laughs> in the dirt to get that shot. <laughs> yeah, it, you know when I was a kid, I always had uh, I always had the grass stains on my knees, weren't on the brand new jeans, and nothing's changed. You know, I'm always uh, I'm always a mess when I get home. So, all yeah, right, yeah. let's go back to smartphone or DSLR. Let's see if we can guess this next photo. Hmm. So my guess for this photo is because it is so wonderfully staged and the details are quite sharp, I'm going to say this is done with the DSLR. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You tricked me. Um, this is actually, <laughs> so it's not a smartphone. It is a, uh, it was shot handheld with the new um, mirrorless medium format Hasselblad. Oh. 
Um, Fancy. But when you look at this, you know, um, now all of a sudden you've got a, you've got, you're starting with an image that's 50 megapixels, um, and then goes up from there depending on how much retouching you do and that sort of thing. But the detail that's in this image um, is pretty mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, the question, you know, and when it comes to that stuff, now all of a sudden you have uh, um, wonderful images and the, the ability to, um, you know, create some beautiful work. And the question is, given the current uh, market, I should say, out there, um, how much is enough and how much is too much? Yeah. You know, suddenly you've got you've got to beef up your your storage files, you know, and um, are you going to be submitting files like this that are just going to be brought back down so that they can go in, you know, depending on their, you know, they can go really large, but if you're not using them really large, is it overkill? That's the question. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. But beautiful image and beautiful, beautiful results. Okay, so this is, this must be the next uh, smartphone or DSLR photo. Um, hmm. Correct. So the, f so again, I, I think I've tried to take photos like this before and have failed miserably with an SLR because it's dark typically inside the car and it's bright outside of the car. So the fact that this photo is quite balanced interior and exterior, I would say this is a camera phone photo. You are correct, sir. Ah. <laughs> I'm sneaky, aren't I? I'm pretty good. Yeah. I almost said SLR. I was like, he wouldn't You're put really this many this many camera phone photos, but my uh yeah. yeah. And what we're what you know, what we're learning sometimes, you know, what it goes back to what I talked about in the beginning. It's sometimes the best thing you have is what's in your hand at the moment, you know? Um that was a moment and it it um it needed to be captured. Yeah. And that's what I have. Um and sometimes that'll work, you know. Uh, we have situations in the magazine where we have things that are shot with a, with a with an iPhone, uh, um, and and it definitely works. Um, and it, it depends on. I always like to think of my photography kind of like going for a plane. You always have to think, what's the end result, right? When's the plane taking off? You know, what's what are we going to do with this at the end? You know, so. If it's going to be a small little image, you know, it's just a quarter of a page or an eighth of a page or something like that, the quality is fine. And if I'm going to turn it into a billboard, probably not. But I've got to look at that end result and work back from there. And will this, will this, tool, will this tool allow me to create the image that I need to create for the client? Right. So um, if, it, if it allows me to get into a place that I normally wouldn't be able to, I'll use it. Use it, absolutely. Absolutely. So since that was a wonderful picture of the gentleman driving, uh, that leads us to the next uh, tip, tip number eight, and that is how to place people when you're taking pictures of them with their Porsche. Well, one of the things to remember here is, um, oh, this is a different thing. This was a, um, uh, yeah, this was a, this was a, a workshop that I did at Bruce Canapas, and uh, the shot of Bruce and I. Um, but the um, the difficult thing here is that there were so many different opportunities. Uh, so this was just a uh, this was presented to me the other day, and we we missed the whole car. We missed a lot of the, the facial expressions and that sort of thing. This is a one thing I do like to do when I'm photographing someone is if they're an owner of the vehicle, have them do something that only the owner would be able to do. And that have them lean in. It's a great reflection of him on the hood of his car. He can get in there and get physical with the automobile. Ask them to do something that no one else could do. And maybe that's sitting in the car. Maybe that's leaning on the hood. Here's an example here, too. Always a kind of a tricky shot to shoot somebody that's in the car, but there's a way to do it that's still... Um, you can see enough of the car. You've got these all these different pieces. No, notice at the same time, I'm using rule of thirds. He's off to the side there a little bit. Um, if you get down too low and that sort of thing, you start to get a different angle with people, and it doesn't really work. But if you come down in on them, it really works. And here's another. This is a favorite shot of mine, 
just that that owner with his car at the end of the day. I literally was walking away from the shoot, turned around and said, stop. And I just had to take it. You know, sometimes... That is a gorgeous that. photo. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. And it's just one of those things that just... Um, um, you know, it, it's it's a moment that you uh, uh, that I just had to. Now here's this. Is that Grant? That story. Uh, yes, it that, is Grant. That is Mark, Grant, so, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and and um, he, uh, I, um, if you have a moment, I'll tell you the backstory on this one. I was walking over. At, uh, we were at the parade last year, and um, I asked him. I said, you know, there's a couple of things uh, I've realized that. You've taken what you did as a child and you've turned it into a career. You were always doodling as a kid, right, drawing cards. He goes, yeah. I said, well, that tells me that you're really in touch with your inner child. He goes, I guess so. I said, well, in that case, and as I'm talking to him, I'm walking him over to the fountain. So and then I said, in that case, would you mind just flipping off your shoes, rolling up your pants, and, and climbing into this fountain and kicking the water irreverently like a child? Well, much to my surprise, he turned to me and immediately said, let's do it. Um, wow. And there he is. And it's, it's one of those shots. I will always remember the shot. I'll always remember the moment. And it's just, uh, it's, it's one of my favorites. And uh, what, a, what a great, great guy. Um, That's a great so, shot. And Grant, yeah, totally Grant is great. a great friend of PCA's. Yeah. Oh, wow. So can we go back to that photo of the gentleman sitting in the car? So here's, I'm very curious about this shot because um, the light difference when you're standing outside pointing your camera at someone sitting inside the car and they're sitting in, in the car where it's dark. And so this right. photo looks very balanced. How did you, so you have details of the interior that isn't darkened up, but then his skin and other colors aren't blown out of before. So how did you, or was it a cloudy day? Like this is a very balanced, interior shot which is well, which is very hard to capture. I, I, uh, I uh, thank you. But what I do is a, it's a little trick. I use a, a I use a um, a uh, on camera flash and what I'll do is I use a diffuser on it and rather than having it go directly towards the subject, I have it in this case I tore I spun the um, the top of it over to the right and what I because I don't have the front of it. Now I just have that side sliver of the of the flash that went in and popped it off and, and, and lit up that area. Just a little, just a subtle little bump of light in there to catch to make sure his eyes are sharp and that sort of thing. And that's all it takes. It just takes a little bit of extra light in there and about controlling that. So okay, uh, I'll shoot a few different ones and I'll keep angling that until I find it exactly where I want it to be. Um, but I think you have an example of the, one of those flashes there. Yeah. And if you just take it and turn it to the side, all of a sudden you can really adjust the amount of light that you're offering into the the, uh, the image. So it's about you can always always go too far. It's about not going too far at all. Just just a little bit. You just want a little bit. And so it's easy to do. I have I have my flash here. So if people want to see, maybe we can switch the angle up here. So I always carry my flash, even though it's a bright sunny, especially in a bright sunny day, if I'm carrying my DSLR to, to a show, I always have my flash attached, which people are like, there's so much light, why do you need it? And that's exactly for situations like that. I can, this I have a diffuser on, but you can also change and point it, as Michael said, off to the side when you're, when you're taking a photo. So it's not direct harsh light onto your subject. So that's why I carry this. All right, so real quickly, I just want to let uh, folks know uh, we have the winner for the autograph print. We'll send it directly to him. He just needs to get his information to Damon. Um, Don Chasen from Angels Camp, California. So Don, congratulations. Make sure we get your address information and we'll send that to you. And to Roger Moose from Salinas, two California winners, look at that. Uh, Roger from right. Salinas, California. We will get you this Kef Muo directly to your house. Congratulations. All right, the last two uh, tips. Let, oh, actually, the, the, the ninth one we've already talked about. We've talked about polarizers. Um, but maybe you can go a little bit more detail. We've got about another 10 minutes. Uh, we talked about using a polarizer 
to minimize reflections, um, why else would you use a polarizer? Well, it, it's going to um, even everything out for you. You know, um, it. Um, I I like to use it to just um, soften. You know, it just kind of like takes things down a little bit for me, so I have less to worry about later. You know, um, a lot of people get very um, uh, particular about their polarizer and. And I'm pretty, pretty simple with it. And the, you can go in if you have a, if you have a, another advantage is if you have something that's really, um, you got a hot spot somewhere um, that's coming into the lens. You can actually rotate that polarizer, and you'll see that that hot spot will disappear. So that's another little trick you can do with your polarizer. And um, next time you have it on there, don't tighten it all the way. Just leave it kind of loose and then you can rotate it left and right, and you can watch that little hot spot change, and you can pretty much eliminate it if you have a, that happening in your, in your image. Of course, nowadays, um, it's kind of funny because you'll, you'll want the, the softness and the, and the, to reduce all the uh, um, reflections, but at the same time, all of a sudden, flare has become a cool thing, and people are putting it in afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> There's even, uh, you know, so it, it's, um, you know, sometimes you have to embrace it. Sometimes you don't want it there. So um, it's up to you. I've, what's what's good today may not be good tomorrow. So That's a very cool tip it, about it, having the polarizer loose. I've you know when I use a polarizer, I just spin it on tight to because I'm worried about it falling off. But that's a great tip to leave it loose. So as you're taking photos, you can rotate the polarizer and see how it makes a difference in the shot. Very cool. Yeah, try it next time. Cool. Try it next time. Our final tip has to do, we talked about the flash earlier, but the final tip is actually using your flash. Someone I think on, um, on the chat was wondering what flash this was. David Ogburn was wondering what flash this is. This is a Canon 600 EXRT. I think it's probably three or four years old. Uh, if you're wondering what this thing is, it's not uh, carry out Tupperware. It's actually a diffuser made by Gary Fong and you can check it out at GaryFong.com. And um, they make different, different models and, and such, but I find this one really useful if you've ever taken a photo of a person indoors with a flash. Uh, you've probably seen you know, the forehead super bright and everything that you know, ends up being dark. What this does is it just evens out the light and makes it look a lot, a lot more natural. Uh, and then of course, um, as Michael said, you can, if you have a flash such as this, you can aim where you want that light to go as opposed to going directly to your subject and creating a bright spot on their forehead. Anything else to add about flashes, Michael? Uh, I think there's a couple of images there that'll, like here, this would have been a great opportunity to use a flash. Right. Um, but I think you have a couple of images there that'll show an interior where I just popped a little bit of light in there. Um, I'm, maybe we can pull those up, but uh, again, just the same, the same one I used for the, uh, for the gentleman, but just managing it a little bit and being able to balance that shot out, uh, that shot will, will really change things with a little bit of fill flash in there. Yeah. If you really were to use a little bit of fill flash on that, that, that sh interior shot, you know, the center of that steering wheel would have been much more even with everything else as opposed to a dark spot. So we got a question from Kay Fassberg. What tools do you use to determine the light at a certain location and at a certain time of day? Good question. Okay, there's, um, there's a couple of apps that are great that you can just put in your phone. Um, the one I like um, is called Sun Scout. Um, and uh, there are several different ones. You can just, and it utilizes the um, the rays that are, when you go there, you can at that particular time of day, you can catch the light through the through the camera, and it's going to show you the actual tracking of the sun, and at what time the sun will be in a particular place. There are several different ones out there, but there's it's just an app in your phone, and you can predict basically um, what it's going to be like tomorrow. Uh, or what it's going to be like in four hours. Oh, wow. Um, and um, 
I recently uh, had a situation I was shooting out in the desert, and I wanted the hills out in the, the far side to be lit up, but I knew at exactly 5.04 the, the sun was going to go behind the hill behind me, and still, so the car was going to be in shadow, but the, the higher elevation hills beyond that would still be lit up, and it worked out perfectly. It's, it's like um, on cue. Yeah. The sun wow. dripped, dropped over, and it was showtime. So Perfect. great little tools. There's a couple of different ones, but that's what, that's the one I use most. Okay. Um, and there's different ways that you can uh, uh, also, um, there's some things where you can uh, track exactly where you are and the light pattern in terms of shade and that sort of thing through the, throughout the day. They can be very elaborate. I like to keep things simple. <laughs> All right, I believe we have one more smartphone or DSLR photo. So let's see if we can throw that one up. Oh, we don't? Okay, all right. So we do have, let's just quickly recap. We have uh, the 10 tips for better photos, but then we're gonna get into a few of your favorite photos. But to recap, 10 tips for your photos. One, watch for the reflections. Two, watch for the intersections. Three, move your body, move around. Four, composition. Make sure you compose something that's interesting and that is going to lead into number five, which is engaging the viewer. Number six, get low, get low, get low, or maybe even get high to change that perspective. Seven is utilize lighting uh, properly. Eight, placing people, engaging them with their car, make them look like they own the car as opposed to standing 10 feet away from it. Uh, utilizing a polarizer and then also uh, the last one is using the flash and bouncing light to get the desired look so the next the next little part we have about three minutes here I wanted you know we've seen a few of your your, your photos that are amazing but I asked Michael to share with us a few of his favorite photos so if you could we can bring them up and maybe a couple of remarks on why these are your favorite photos I think they're looking for it. And while they're looking for it, um, if you like the tips that you've heard today from Michael Allen Ross, um, he does have workshops. In fact, we're going to have a PCA video. Uh, you saw the uh, Canapa uh, photo earlier. That is from a video shoot slash workshop that we did last year. And that video will be on PCA's YouTube channel here in the near future. Um, but it looks like we've got your favorite photos on, so you want to uh, share with us why. I mean, obviously they're beautiful, but why are they your favorites? Well, thank you. You know, it, it, it really comes down to, um, um, it really comes down to composition for me. Um, telling the story within the image. Um, it's what you want, what you want to do is try to create an energy um, and at the same time, choose a composition that engages the viewer and, and allows them to come in and really start to tell their own story. That's the real key to everything. Um, and this, like this shot here was, it was about racing to the end of the day. You know, we were out of light in the town and, and I saw the light was still up on the bridge and we ran up to the bridge and we got the best shots of the day. Um, it's about those moments here, this 40 Merc built by Rob Ida an incredible day out there and of course this gt2 it's the composition that is where i try to engage the viewer and get them to stop a little bit um create an image that tells a story i love this little ramp there's movement in the in the image without even having movement in the image by having those lines and, and choosing exactly where you want those lines to go and of course this uh shooting in sweden a few years back uh, they hadn't seen the sun in months, and when everybody else wanted to leave, I said, no, let's stay, let's stay, and we stayed an extra half an hour, and boom, all of a sudden there was blue sky. They hadn't seen it in three months. It's about pushing yourself beyond where people want to go and about hanging in there and pushing that envelope. Every time you do it, you will be rewarded, every time. Uh, when everybody wants to go away, everybody wants to go home, keep shooting. Uh, here's another example. This is near and dear. It's right near, near me here, uh, the tunnel going into San Francisco. But again, telling a story, those lights going off into the distance and that car shooting into the tunnel. It's the composition 
don't just take a picture. Create an image and take the time to create that image. Um, you'll, uh, you'll thank yourself in the end. It's worth the effort. Stunning, stunning photos. Um, I will aspire to get to that level. I will keep, keep trying to take photos like that. For our viewers, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this episode, episode number seven. Uh, if you did, be sure to like below uh, with a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. I want to thank again um, Kef for the speaker. I want to thank Michael Allen Ross, obviously, for the autographed photo, but for sharing his knowledge with us so that we can be better photographers and create not just photos, but create stunning images. So until next time, we'll see you. Be safe, be healthy, and uh, have a good night. Bye-bye.